Our next speaker I first met at Reason in the Rock, and he just kind of walked up to me very quickly, which is kind of terrifying because he's really tall and I'm not. But it turns out he's really, really amazing, and I'm so happy to have him here at Skepticon. So please give a warm welcome to Arn Ra. Thank you, Skepticon. I must apologize. My voice is a bit gone. It's especially bad that I'm going to be following such a professional DJ. And I'm going to be giving discussion. Oh, my gosh, it went completely out, didn't it? <clears throat> oh, that's awful. And I'm going to be talking about lizard bats. OK, a couple of months ago, uh, we had the surreal experience of going to a church down in Texas to listen to famed atheist professor P.Z. Myers give a speech on the evolution of bats. The sanctuary was empty. Everyone was in the critical thinking room. So you know right away it's not your typical Methodist church. The pastor identifies as a non-theist. Austin is weird. <laughs> the point of PZ's speech was how thin the fossil record is with regard to bats. But he said that you don't need fossils to trace bat evolution because we can do that with the genome. And that's true. And it's also true that Darwin formulated his theory not based on fossils, but based on uh, embryology and taxonomy. He made a lot of predictions about what we would find in the fossil record, but they were not based on the fossils. Uh, there weren't that many fossils around, and none of them were the ones that he needed. Um, so the only thing he referred to was the recognition that previous forms existed and have since gone extinct. So PZ, let me see, let's see if this works. Ah, it doesn't work. Has somebody fixed this? Yeah, good. No power. Okay, thank you. I've never held this before, I don't know. Okay, so, here we go. So PZ comes on Dogma Debate with me, David Smalley, and Rachel Nannan Brown, who is a paleontologist herself. And he begins to diss on her field of expertise by saying that if you have developmental biology and phylogeny, you don't need paleontology. Well, that's true, but what if you don't have either of those things because you're studying a form that has no living relatives, uh, no living descendants, or discernible relatives, and which is known only from the fossil record? Studying the evolution of pterosaurs is no different than studying the evolution of bats except that you don't have a genome to act as a cheat sheet. You've got to do it yourself the old-fashioned way with meticulous analysis of comparative morphology to determine derived synapomorphies. And in the past, I have uh, given talks on the controversies in the cladistic classification of dogs, cats, monkeys, turtles, um, and of course humans. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the classification of pterosaurs, which is actually far more controversial than any other group except for birds, and the classification of birds is intertwined with that. Now, the first problem is that uh, most people think that, that pterosaurs are flying dinosaurs. And all the kids that I knew growing up actually called them dinosaur birds, although they are neither birds nor dinosaurs. And uh, most people don't know any more about the fossil record than what they've seen in a few plastic pieces in a prehistoric playset. When I was growing up, most people thought that this was the entirety of what was known in the fossil record. And they thought that everything here was a dinosaur. So to make this easy, I'm going to remove all of the dinosaurs from this grouping, all except for one. Now, 
The, in the top right hand corner there's a yellow terror bird, that actually is a dinosaur, and I'll explain that momentarily. Uh, down in the lower right, the uh, pliosaurs beneath it are not dinosaurs. The three organisms closest to this uh, tree at the bottom are actually mammal-like reptiles that come from a time before the dinosaurs. And a lot of people don't realize that there even was a time before the dinosaurs. Uh, and then you have a pair of pterosaurs at the top, and everything else here is a mammal. Now, some creationists, like Carl Gallup, believe that even mammals from the fossil record should be considered dinosaurs. But not everything that is big and dead is a dinosaur. <laughs> so before this gets too confusing, we're going to put some structure to this. We're going to look in the tree of life. Now, um, there are many ways to represent this, but I prefer this method, this familiar format, uh, because it best illustrates the concept of monophyletic clades. Recognize that every folder in this grouping is a clade which includes all of its descendants and which is marked by the emergence of diagnostic traits, also known as cinepomorphies. I'm just going to skim through these, selecting animals and then bilaterally symmetrical animals. From that group, we will select those that have backbones and jaws, and from that group, we will select the ones that have legs and also feet and toes, and then we'll select amniotes. I'm going to have to kind of look at this. This is the group we want to start with. These are tetrapoidal vertebrates who develop in an amniotic fluid. This is a very important step in the transition from sea to land. And after this point, they continue to branch out. This first grouping is synapsids, that's mammals, and uh, things that are mammal-like or very nearly mammals. Uh, the next group begins our reptilian collection, but these are not yet reptiles, these are para-reptiles, and this is where you find turtles and turtle-like things. There's some controversy here, but I've already done a video on that one. And in the folder of newer forms, we have diapsids. So if you excuse their transitional forms also, the three important groups we have here are synapsids, anapsids, and diapsids. And every actual reptile you've ever seen has been a diapsid. As they diversify and their biology continues to develop, uh, most of them look superficially like lizards, uh, except for these guys. Look what's happening here. This is a dramatic demonstration of macroevolution within a single clade. And I should point out that the species represented in this illustration represent only a quarter of what is known from this group, which is pretty impressive, considering that it's only from the fossil record. And the fossil record only gives us a glimpse of the fauna that previously existed. If you find a half of a single individual of an animal, you can rest assured there were thousands of others like it that we haven't seen yet. And it's important to bear that in mind. Now, uh, the family tree of all reptiles has a deep fork in it, which begins right here, at the division of Lepidosaurs and Archosaurs. Now, on the Lepidosaur side, we have vaguely lizard-like forms, which is very generalized design, with a lot of potential development in different forms. For example, here are your placodonts and plesiosaurs, pliosaurs, and nothosaurs. I think in Seth's talk, somebody mentioned a plesiosaur being a dinosaur. Nope, sorry. Uh, they're closer to lizards. Further out on this limb, we have actual lizards. That's in the order Squamata. Everything that is actually a lizard fits in this box. That's uh, everything from skinks to snakes, uh, iguanos, geckos, um, Gila monsters and horny toads, as my family would refer to them. This is a, is a clade of 9,000 extant species, whereas every remnant of all these other clades is now extinct, with one exception. Sphenodonts from New Zealand are the last of their kind. There are dozens known from the fossil record, but only the Tuatara survives. And uh, these are not lizards, but they're classified along with lizards because they do share one or two diagnostic traits. Um, 
one of them being that uh, Lepidosaurs, or the you know, Lepidosaurs, uh, typically have three eyes. Now, you may have caught lizards as a child, you may have had a pet iguana, and not noticed that third eye. But if you look very carefully and closely on practically any lizard, you should find one scale on the top of the brain that is a different color than all of the others. And this scale is attached to the pineal gland. It only sees light or dark, but uh, it is, the tests have shown that it is critical in telling the animal how long to stay in the sun to maintain its body temperature for the fuel storage that it has. Uh, next, we will compare Lepidosaurus with Archosaurus. The smaller of these is an adult crocodilian, which gives you an idea how big the other one is. The one with flippers instead of feet is actually a lizard, a real lizard. Uh, the largest lizards ever discovered. It's a mosasaur. Their closest living relatives are monitor lizards like the Komodo dragon. Now, like every other amnio, the earliest archosaurs were superficially lizard-like, but not actually lizards. Uh, following their evolution, we come to another important fork in the road. Cruatarsi includes crocodiles and things that look like or act like crocodiles, but we're not concerned with the primitive archosaurs. We want to see the really advanced ones. And this is where we find pterosaurs. And if you'll notice, pterosaurs are very close to the origin of dinosaurs. And this is the simplest way I can put this fairly. Uh, this represents roughly 130 species now known. It's usually divided between the uh, pterodactyloids and the rempharynchoids. And there's some discrepancies here. There are, but these are not the controversies. The disagreements that go on here are the expert analysis of people who don't have a genome to follow and who could make mistakes. But these are honest ones. The controversies make more of a statement about a person's character. But before you can understand that, I have to give you some background story. Before Darwin was famous, England was already a leader in paleontological studies due largely to an intrepid fossil hunter named Mary Anning, um, who was not given much credit for it in life, partly because she was too poor to associate with the aristocracy, uh, and partly because she was labeled as a religious dissenter and was thus subject to discrimination. But mostly her problem was her gender. The Geological Society of London was an old boys club with no girls allowed. Experts would consult with her, uh, but her name was not included in any of their publications. And the Royal Society did not formally recognize her contribution to science until 2010, 163 years after she died. Now, 200 years ago, when she was only 12 years old, she discovered the first ichthyosaur fossil ever found, and the first plesiosaur fossil, and the second species of pterosaur, a dimorphodon, um, previously a uh, pterodactylus, had been found in Germany. And they were neither of them very big, so they didn't look very different to Victorian eyes from bats or birds. And then soon after, other curious fossils begin to come from the British Geological Survey, representing as many at that time as a half a dozen different species of gigantic reptile, unlike anything that, the, that had lived in the modern day. Now, Sir Richard Owen was a renowned anatomist of the Royal Society when he, des when he described Megalosaurus, which essentially means big-ass lizard, <laughs> because that's what they thought these things were. The other one here, um, below it, uh, was recognized initially by a single tooth that looked like an iguana's tooth, only much, much bigger. So they thought that it was a 30-foot-long iguana. And then once they got more of the, the fossil, as you can see here, it still wasn't well understood. Now, Richard Owen recognized common traits between these gigantic lizards, 
including fused sacral vertebrae, and the fact that their legs don't splay, but they're more like mammals in that they support the weight directly like columns. And he classified them together in, I think it was 1847, under the name dinosaur, which means terrible lizard. Um, but that's not the way he wanted to describe them. He wanted them to be fearfully great lizards, perfect from their original creation. And yes, he thought they were created. Sir Richard Owen was a, a world authority in paleontology in his time. He was a creationist, but he knew more than anyone about the successive layers in the geologic column. And this caused him to reconcile things in an interesting way. Where today's creationists would talk about the baromenology of created kinds, Owen believed in archetypes of divine design. Uh, it's difficult to make out what he's saying because uh, he's vague, he's ambiguous, sometimes he contradicts himself. But in general, you get the idea that he thinks that God would release new and improved models every so often when the previous models were running down. And see, uh, like many creationists, Owen had the impression that evolution was a ladder of steadily increasing complexity in progressive advances to higher forms. But he recognized that dinosaurs were bigger and better than any modern reptile. And so this meant that they couldn't have evolved. He thinks that these magnificent monsters somehow degenerated into the barely functional, cold-blooded, sluggish reptiles we have today. And this was the explanation that he gave for why we previously had ichthyosaurs, where now we had dolphins, why megalosaurus and iguanodon uh, were replaced by carnivorous mammalia and so on, and why the fossil record for pterosaurs ends before the fossil record for birds begin, which is at least what it was in his day. Now, another anatomist, uh, well, as more fossils were found, and these things started to flesh out, uh, it turned out that these were much more advanced than Owen was prepared to accept, and it made it uncomfortable for his position, because they were much more bird-like than he wanted to admit. Another anatomist named uh, Huxley, who famously hated Owen, deep rivals, recognized immediately a similarity in the hind legs to that of birds. And Huxley began a sort of a war with uh, Owen over this, uh, this trait. He argued that ratite birds, like emus and ostriches, had descended directly from dinosaurs. And there was some controversy with some other scientists at the time because no one was prepared to understand how you could evolve an ostrich out of an iguanodon. And so there was some arguments about which traits were inherent and which traits were convergent. And these arguments, by the way, were carried out in public literature. You post your argument and uh, you piss off the people who then post their counter arguments against you. And it's not a lot different than the blogosphere. It's just a lot slower and there's almost no trolls. <laughs> now, as soon as anyone saw what a theropod foot looked like, they immediately pointed to trackways that had been discovered. And it had originally been attributed to birds of enormous proportions, and of course decided that these might have been made by dinosaurs. Um, Owen had uh, refuted that temporarily when he reconstructed the skeleton of a giant moa from New Zealand. Now here was a gigantic bird that could have made many of those tracks. And uh, the fact that these ratite birds had exactly the same shape and structure to their legs was, according to Owen, a borrowed trait, uh, essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, essentially an, an argument of common design to common designer, except that the designer in this case is able to borrow parts from other creations. Um, now, Owen was trained in Linnaean taxonomy, which held that uh, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals were separate categories where it was impossible to derive one from the other. But these were usually rooted in fundamental commonality, which Owen himself did not always adhere to. Owen's idea of archetypes had him classify animals by what he called their unity of type. So he held that uh, reptiles and amphibians were essentially the same thing. 
uh, and he put mammals and birds side by side on a higher level due to their warm-bloodedness. Um, and he wanted to make sure that these lines did not overlap. So he wanted to put a line of distinction between birds and reptiles and also between mammals and reptiles. Now, Owen compared mammals and birds based on their behaviors like parental care. And these, he thought, were the diagnostic traits that distinguished warm-blooded animals from cold-blooded ones. He said that the particulars in which birds differ from all mammals and agree with reptiles are comparatively unimportant ones of the skeleton. So somehow the foundational biology is inconsequential and only the superfluous surface attributes are diagnostic. Now, here in the 20th century, uh, I would argue that uh, evolution leads to a series of incremental changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities, and I would trace an evolutionary lineage according to that rule. And embryology would bear that out too. But people of the 18th and 19th centuries were surprisingly superficial and concerned with more with the facade than the foundation. And like when attempting to determine the origin of birds, for example, some people linked them to turtles simply because both animals had beaks. So if your contemporaries are able to believe something as ridiculous as that, imagine the reaction once pterosaurs were discovered. Folks readily assumed that birds must have evolved from pterosaurs, despite how different the fundamental structure was. And remember that there is a traditional folklore that if you adopt the clothing and behavior of a thing, you could become that thing. And maybe that's where these ideas are coming from. Darwin, however, was much more progressive than most others in his day. Uh, well above the typical prejudice of judging a book by its cover, he examined the way life develops from the inside out and not from the other way around. So he predicted that if his theory was true, then there would be a bird found in the fossil record with unfused wing fingers. And his prophecy was fulfilled just two years later when they found the first Archaeopteryx. Now imagine the reaction to that. Paleontologists didn't know what to make of it. Huxley argued that giant flightless ratite birds like ostriches and emus had evolved directly from dinosaurs and that their wings were in a stage of development. Uh, so he imagined that someday ostriches might fly. Um, H.G. Seeley tried to draw a link between Archaeopteryx and pterosaurs since they both have the superficial ability to fly. And then Andreas Wagner, who obviously I couldn't find a picture of, <laughs> thought that Archaeopteryx was just a feathered pterosaur, as if that makes any sense. Now, <coughs> excuse me, all these men came to realize in time why they were wrong, and they changed their minds accordingly, but not Owen. Owen famously refused ever to admit any error except by way of evasive maneuver. Uh, Owen seized on this collective confusion to devise another wedge between birds and reptiles. He largely ignored Huxley's minority opinion that birds were evolved from dinosaurs and instead tried to strengthen the link to pterosaurs that had already been uh, promoted by most of the scientific community at that time. He wrote a detailed uh, comparison of Archaeopteryx to Pterodactylus and he said that every bone in the bird in the, every bone in the bird was antecedently present in the framework of the pterodactyle. And the way that he phrased it, it seemed that if Archaeopteryx had evolved from anything, then pterosaurs had to be the closest link. And then he changed the argument explaining how it was impossible to derive any of these traits to get an Archaeopteryx from a pterosaur. Now, he hadn't yet succeeded in separating Archaeopt or, or separating reptiles from birds. Um, he still needed to deal with the elongated, unfused wing fingers that Darwin had predicted. So he found a single trait in the ankle of the Archaeopteryx, which was still uniquely avian, and he declared that Archaeopteryx was just a bird, an unusual bird, but just a bird nonetheless. And he said of the wing fingers and of the long tail that, again, these were relatively unimportant. So all that matters are whatever supports Owen's arguments, and when it doesn't, they can be dismissed without consideration. 
Owen had a reputation for spinning information to make it look like it supported him, and he wasn't above making things up to suit his position either. Huxley had famously called him out for that before. Uh, these men viewed each other with contempt, and when they posted their studies, they included criticisms against each other in a flame war. Can you imagine professional scientists in the modern day berating each other in public media? So Owen made a prediction of his own, hoping to counter Darwin's. Uh, the first Archaeopteryx fossil ever found was missing its head. So Owen predicted that later finds would show that it had a normal toothless beak like every other bird known to that time. Of course, later finds proved him wrong, as fossil birds turned out to have teeth in their beaks, like many pterosaurs did also. But it got worse when they found the head for Archaeopteryx because it didn't have a beak. It just had a reptilian maw full of teeth. How embarrassing for Owen. However, before anyone knew any of that, another dinosaur, a non-avian dinosaur, had already ruined Owen's prediction and his position. And I told you that the scientists of the 18th and 19th centuries were superficial, judging affectations over foundation. And here is a demonstration of that. Not all of the Archaeopteryx fossils had feather impressions. Two did not, and because of that one superficial surface trait, they were misidentified as something else. Compsonathus, a very diminutive dinosaur, uh, and when this was realized, when the, when the mix-up was realized, Huxley seized on it and wrote an article describing Compsonathus and, and its confusion with Archaeopteryx as showing all of the same traits that Owen had identified as being a dinosaur and that the purely avian trait that was attributed to Archaeopteryx actually existed in Compsonathus. And then you compare Archaeopteryx to a modern bird. Archaeopteryx, truthfully, is not a bird, but it is a dinosaur. There's not a single trait that is uniquely or particularly avian in this animal. Now, uh, well, up to this point in history, there was one. Um, there was the, uh, the collarbone, but the, the collarbone, which fuses into a single, bo a single bone called the wishbone, of course, which was then found in uh, Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus and uh, Deinonychus originally, and then a host of others. So, uh, hey. Now even Seeley was convinced, having become a, uh, something of an expert in pterosaurs himself, and he also found himself bashing Owen because Owen had uh, described pterosaurs as being cold-blooded, lethargic, barely operable things, and he was realizing that they were definitely warm-blooded and high energetic, and it's now understood that uh, some of the larger pterosaurs were, not, were so adept at flight that they could go transoceanic that they could fly thousands of miles in a single launch. Now, yeah. okay, now we get back into the description of them. Uh, Seeley divided the dinosaur clade into two halves, the lizard-hipped and the bird-hipped, and he thought, of course, that birds evolved from the bird-hipped dinosaurs, but as we go back through this line, uh, the fossil record shows a sequence of the pubis bone moving into the avian position, so that it's indistinguishable. And we also find fossil impressions revealing uh, four-chambered hearts and every other attribute once believed to belong to birds alone, including gizzards and gastroliths. We found quite a few dinosaurs that are very close to birds and some that uh, are so close that we can't tell if they're birds or not. And then we found some that are definitely not birds but which still have feathers. And we've learned more about the paleo world in the last two, three decades than we have in the last two or three centuries. Uh, for example, here is the Velociraptor and the Oviraptor from Disney's movie Dinosaur. They were both depicted naked. Uh, however, since then, we've made some interesting discoveries. First of all, Velociraptors have the same quill burrs in their forearms that vultures have, implying that they had wings, even though they couldn't fly. And why would that be? What would you use a half wing for, as Ken Ham used to argue in his creationist seminars? And this is demonstrated by its closest cousin, the oviraptor. It's sitting on a nest. 
what other proof do you need that it is warm-blooded? And look at the way the arms are draped over the eggs. You can't insulate those without wings. And insulating a larger clutch of eggs is a very strong evolutionary pressure. So this much more than flight. Uh, now, let's see. Does this ruin Jurassic Park for any of you? Does this? So in the same year that Disney's dinosaur came out, there was another fossil found that uh, confirmed how dinosaurs had adapted their ability to fly. It was a four-winged glider called Microraptor. Uh, an ornithologist named C. William Beebe had uh, detected a trait in Archaeopteryx that others had somehow missed, that Archaeopteryx had flight feathers in its hind legs. But they weren't enough to actually do anything with. They weren't enough to be buoyant with. So he predicted a hypothetical precursor to that, which was a four-winged glider, and he named it Tetraptrix. He didn't know that we would call it Microraptor because this illustration of his prediction was published a century ago in 1915. This was someone who's definitely on the right track. Now we're going to talk about somebody who's on the wrong track. How is it, with everything that I've just told you, that we still get stories in the news like this? I can tell you one of the, one of the possible explanations is that whenever you see a story that's, or a news story, whether it's in the peer-reviewed journals or whether it's in the popular press, um, when they took claim that birds did not descend from dinosaurs, guaranteed it's coming from the same author again and again. Uh, in the 1990s, this argument, by the way, was talking about how uh, you can't have an evolution from the hepatic piston lung system of crocodiles into the highly advanced avian respiration system, which is extremely advanced. I don't want to explain it right now because I'm running out of time already, I think. But they said you couldn't evolve this. The first time I read this argument was in the 1990s. Notice that this article is written in 2009. And this uh, argument was disproved in 2005 when Archaeopteryx and several theropod dinosaurs were found to have a fully avian uh, respiration system. What's the problem with this is, I've often said that it, is that it is dishonest to assert as fact that which is not evidently true. And that worse than that, I think, is when you refuse to accept any evidence that you might be wrong. Now, in the 1990s, a uh, paleontologist named John Rubin gathered together with Alan Faduka and a handful of their associates to form a group called BAND. Birds are not dinosaurs. Their mission statement was to deny any and all evidence that would link birds as descendants of dinosaurs. Reuben is not a creationist. What his motivation is, I couldn't imagine. But every time you see this claim in the media, you will find his name or Faduka's name attached to that article. At this point, I would say, with the bias intended, pay it no mind. Yeah. What, what happened here? Oh, OK. There's a video that's supposed to play that I think isn't. OK. Well, I'll just have to slip past that then. The video was one that was taken from uh, the great dinosaur feather mystery, and it shows how feathers develop. They start out as a feather bud. It turns into a spike. The spike tears apart into different filaments like down. Uh, with some of them, the way they develop, they'll, that spike will turn into a rachia, and then the fronds will separate out like that. And these are various uh, evolutionary stages. We've mapped them in the uh, embryology. And we've also seen each stage, each embryological stage, mapped in the development of theropod dinosaurs, only in theropods. Now, let's see. There we go. There's the spike that it starts out of. And here's the down. And the rachia. And then you've got these barbules 
that sew the whole thing together. And I apologize that this is not working, so I'm going to have to jump here. Okay. Because I had a lot to describe during that. Okay, so this does not mean that protofilaments uh, did not exist previous to that. Um, they have been found, as I said, on theropod dinosaurs. And he, here's the most primitive version of a feather that we can still see. Uh, these are on emus, of course. This is the most famous picture of an emu, I think, that anyone's ever seen. When you do a Google image search, this one always comes up. And I'm particularly happy with this picture because this photo was taken down the street from my house. Um, and we took this picture on the same day. And our bird was four months old at that time. I loved that bird, my favorite pet ever. And as you see on his head, you have very thin filaments that could pass for hair. The earliest versions of feathers would look an awful lot like hair. And then, okay. So getting back into the fossil record, and I'm sorry that this has jumped around so much. Okay. Now, and the button doesn't work. Okay, so we've got them in dinosaurs and we have them in pterosaurs. So if you look at the clade Ornithodira, it's a common bond where this type of protofilament could have emerged. But that's not to say that pterosaurs have feathers. The structure, as I say, is different. Uh, Robert Bacher, another controversy, he wanted to change Ornithodira to dinosauria, which would have made pterosaurs into dinosaurs, but there's no reason to do that. Okay. Now back into, if you start at the beginning of the evolution of the feather and you trace it down a different evolutionary line, you get something quite different. So we know that actual feathers, the feathers we're familiar with, went on the theropod side. But if you go on the ornithesians, what if that spike just became more rigid and got a heck of a lot bigger? You could end up with something that they found recently on the tail end of Psittacosaurus. And since this animal, is supposed to be, or is thought to be, ancestral to Triceratops, then that would explain the dermal protrusions that have recently been described on these. Does this ruin Jurassic Park for anyone? What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that would be brutal. Okay. So what about the possibilities for pterosaurs? As I mentioned before, this is a widely diverse group, a very colorful group. They were certainly a lot, a lot less like lizard bats and more like birds or mammals or some sort of combination thereof. Uh, and we don't understand what any of these features, feats or, uh, features or traits are. There's one that has fibers down there. It looks like it strains against water. They've done flight tests with these sorts of things. The models were destroyed when they tried to strain water. So they don't know what these do. And these range from tiny little relatively cute fluttering bats to wheeling hawk type things to animals with hugely powerful crushing jaws. But of course everybody wants to see, oh, these are ridiculous crests, aren't they? And we get into the big ones. Now, for years and years, we, for decades, we were told that pteranodons were the biggest things that ever flew. And then they discovered Ornithochiris and then Quetzalcoatlus, and then Hatsagopteryx. Can you believe this thing flew? If the image here looks a bit like an exaggeration, let me uh, show you this life model. These things were unbelievably lightweight and incredibly powerful. They were able to bolt off the ground to become airborne in a single action, in a single launch. They were also accomplished apex predators. The difference between Hatsagopteryx and uh, Quetzalcoatlus is that Hatsagopteryx could eat you. <laughs> and they are, they are believed to have fed on Tyrannosaur young. And it was easy to do because the skull on these is bigger than the biggest carnosaur. These were your super predators, it would seem. Now, what about the evolution of pterosaurs? It's tempting to suggest that uh, they came from a form like this 
Charo Victorix. But the only fossil we have of this, there's only one, and it's partial, and it's not enough to go on. It's not enough to be sure exactly how to classify it. Uh, it's important to notice also that everybody who's ever studied these, uh, these animals, these pterosaurs, have all classified them in the clade of Ornithodira, and that they have descended from a archosaur, uh, presumably Euparcaria. But if you look up these animals, the specific species online, you'll likely see something very different. You're going to see something that is produced by a very competent paleo artist named David Peters. He proposes that pterosaurs are lizards, even though they don't have feathers, because he says they descend from lizards that have feathers. If anyone's confused, I'll help you get worse. He's not a paleontologist. He has no accolades, no degrees, no expertise. He doesn't actually view real fossils. He does all of his analysis by looking at blown up JPEGs and then analyzing them. But he's an extremely prolific artist. And he's been working tirelessly at it for years. He's meticulously designed whole huge phylogenies. And when you try to do research in this field, you will come up with his work at least as often, if not more often, than when you come up with the real science. And I've seen several science websites that have been complaining about this guy. Here's the lizard that he thinks pterosaurs evolved from. This is Longus Garma. This is the way it was first represented. Uh, it was shown in the Disney movie Dinosaur as flittering about like a butterfly with its wings. This is Longus Garma, according to Darren Naish, who's a pterosaur expert. This is what he sees when he looks at the partial fossil they found. Now, when David Peters looked at the same fossil, he saw this. Notice what was added. He says that they have, um, that they're bipedal, that he gave them two wings, that they have elongated fingers, that they have all this additional plumage. He found the second half of the skeleton. He added a tail. He added plumage onto the tail. He then added the same plumage onto all of the other pterosaurs that he was designing after this. And he's determined that it's kind of like when you, when you go to a psychic and they go to read your aura and they try to look at you and see just beyond what the naked eye can see. And he looks at the images of fossils and he tries to see just beyond what all of the experts see. And then he refuses to admit that it could be him that is the one who was mistaken and not absolutely everybody who has ever looked at a fossil with their own eyes. These, by the way, are not feathers. A couple of traits that give it away, you can see an external outline. We know that the way the, fo the feathers develop, they couldn't leave an outside border like this. These are very soft and dimpled, elongated scales. And real scientists have been saying this since this animal was discovered. But the popular media and personal home pages and the creationist websites really want to paint a different picture. And David Peters has taken advantage of that. These two websites, there's a host of other science websites telling people, warning people, do not refer to these. He has undone and reclassified everything that several of the, of the experts have posted in peer-reviewed journals for the last 15 years. Now, I am acting on their advice. Uh, they have acted for anyone who is an advocate of science, anyone who knows how information is properly digested and analyzed, to make note of these things in public media and make the statements appropriate when we encounter such. <laughs> and I'm sorry I was disjointed, and I'm sorry about my voice, but I thank you for your time.